Hey everyone, today I'm talking with Dan White, author of the book Smart Marketing. Dan is really good at illustrating very complex uh, marketing and brand strategy concepts. And we talk about some of his uh, most captivating illustrations. And basically we go through 10 steps or concepts to build a brand and how to do that. So it's a very interesting uh, visual uh, story we go through. So I really hope you enjoy. Hey, Dan, how are you? Morning. I'm great. Thanks, Steph. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dan, uh, I've seen interesting posts and content from you, but for the people that don't know anything about Dan White, could you quickly introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Um, I'm a ex-market researcher and CMO and author of the Smart Marketing book. Um, that's where a lot of the diagrams that you'll have seen on, on things like LinkedIn have come from. A um, bit of background, I would, my claim to fame is that I helped develop the Brand Z brand, value, brand equity system that's used to value brand each, each year to this day, and that's about 20 odd years old. And uh, yeah, I've got a new book coming out in the summer, which maybe if we have time, I can mention at the end. Um, and yeah, and I've, I've also got a website, smartmarketing.me which is a, it's a sort of a labor of love, which is where I house all my, all my illustrations and, and thoughts around all sorts of topics around marketing and, and a bit beyond uh, business as well. Awesome. Well, I mean, uh, I got to know you through um, the, the, the funnel, um, the Hankins hexagon, I think it was. Oh, right, yeah. Um, yeah. And I saw your, your drawings and was very intrigued by them because you really try to present these, these, these concepts in a, in a very simple and, and graphic way, which I think is interesting because there's a lot of very complex language in our industry. So I think uh, it would be very interesting to walk through some visuals and get a sense of like, what your take is on branding and brand building and what that all means. And hopefully we can get into some questions and some, some other thoughts. Sounds good. Sounds, good. Sounds really good. Yeah. So, so we have this hand picked selection <laughs> by, by, by the man himself. Yeah. Uh, so the Apple brand, or maybe just more basic, the question of what is a brand then like, could you, could you yeah. give us your, your view on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the book, I have a, I have a made up example. Um, <laughs> we're actually at the inventor brand because we weren't sure how Apple would react to having some of their assets actually published in a book. But actually, the, I would, um, these are all um, for illustrative purposes and apparently we would have been fine. But anyway, um, yeah, so <laughs> this is a way of thinking, the way I think about what a brand actually is in the sense, a, a common definition of a brand is, you know, all whatever comes to mind when people come across the brand whatever is fires, it, it, whichever neurons and, and their thoughts and feelings and images and sounds actually emerge um, mm -hmm. uh, and ideas when you think about the brand. And I, so I thought I'd draw what, what comes into my mind when I think about Apple. And you can see that actually, you know, having been in business for 30 years and obviously I admired Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs is one of the first things that comes to my mind. And I know roughly mm -hmm. what he looks like, which is very <laughs> roughly, very roughly that. Um, uh, I think of the Genius Bar because I, I had recently, you know, when I drew this diagram, I'd been to a Genius Bar recently, as it happens. Uh, the logo, the, the inf inf famous, the worldwide uh, famous logo, a lot of the products. But also, you remember, I don't know if you remember, you look a lot younger than me, but I'm sure you remember the, the um, um, early iPod ads. The sure. Famous, I'm sure, exactly. That they really stuck in my mind because I thought they were so incredibly powerful and, and right for the brand, etc. So anyway, that, that's a little montage of some of the things that came to my mind. And I showed this to my daughter. And although some of the things sh were very shared, for example, the original iMac, bottom right, she studies, she studied that because she studies, studied the design at university. So that's the kind of thing you're going to talk about. Um, and obviously the famous earphones, those were her, yeah. earphones, her generation, etc. But some weren't. For example, she'd heard of Steve Jobs, but she didn't know what he looked like, for example. So the name came up, but not, not the image of his face. So it's, I thought it was quite interesting. You know, a brand is it's, it's individual to a, each person and can be a bit different, but um, there's also strong threads. And it's that thread that means a brand can have a consistent image across time. 
Yeah, and and that's what's really intriguing to me. Like I've seen some some articles on that lately on whether a brand is like more of a social construct or more of an individual element. Because it's true. I, I think if you would map out like thousands of these associative maps from different people, you'd see a lot of variations. Would you say a brand is then like the the parts that are common, or or how would you say that? It's both. No, I, I think the, the brand is both of those things. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, I think the common ones are important um, because they, they, I mean, in fact, in effect, the common ones are your strongest distinctive brand assets, as, yeah. as, as Byron Chart would, would put it, um, because then you know that using those is, for example, if you use them in your advertising, will help to bring the brand to mind for everyone and, and build a new association. Or, oh, and like you talk about social construct, we, we all know, don't we, that the, the famous ear, um, ear, earbuds were a, a way of uh, what's it called social proof. You mm -hmm. see people wearing them and it's like oh everyone's wearing them and they're, they're cool and look at these cool people and um i must get some so that bit was definitely this this uh, the shared bit is also part of the shared which makes the brand stronger because uh, we know that people like to use brands that other people think are good the social yeah. proof is a powerful mechanism but i would say that the but even for me part of the brand and the investment that apple made 40 years ago you know um uh, well certainly since they they reinvented themselves with the sort of iPod and the iPhone, et cetera. Even some of those early memories that are in my head may not be shared with my daughters, but mm -hmm. they're still part of why I like Apple personally, you know? Yeah. So and, 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 mm. No, but it's interesting because Apple does come up as like every, in every brand yeah. example, like we talk about Apple, we love, we all love Apple, but it's interesting to me, like probably for, for a lot of people, the whole rebellious thing, different side of things that, which is, would now be probably called the brand purpose isn't mm. there anymore in today's brand. And I could, I, I would imagine like most young people don't know the brand per se yeah. as this rebellious quirky thing, but more of like this sleek design thing, which is interesting how, like how it's still two brands for different generations. Yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, well, I think it's, it's one brand, but it, 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 it evolves. And brands have yeah. to evolve. In fact, a brand, if a brand doesn't keep its, its uh, uh, associations, A, refreshed and B, contemporary, it will start to, to lose its edge, uh, which we know some brands have done over time. I, I'm th you just made me think of the example I used to use. This is a, just to show how old these examples are. When I first, <laughs> when I first thought, um, I was teaching about this concept of um, having a, a, co a common thread, but c c keeping the brand refreshed every mm -hmm. every year ongoing. We used to use Madonna, the, the, the pop star. Madonna was the great example. She had yeah. these whole phases of her career where she would do something and then she'd move on. So for, uh, for some years she was, um, uh, do you remember Vogue, the famous iconic, uh, I won't do, I won't do yeah. the action. You know, um, <laughs> a certain look there, as you, you probably remember. And then there was a time when she had the kind of cowboy thing going on yeah. for a few years. Um, yeah. So, so, so anyway, good brands, they, they can have some shared elements, but they, they keep moving on. Yeah. And, and there's something interesting there where it's probably like we all still know Madonna as like this iconic figure and she has something around her that was consistent even throughout these completely like it's different... Crazy. Uh, and that's that's probably interesting it's probably what we call like brand essence or brand purpose or whatever yeah. we want to name it but it's it's a very interesting thing where you can do a lot of different styles and communications but still have like this somewhat of a core but as you show here which is very good for me i think and and we don't talk about brand in this way as often is it's very like it's dependent on the person and the context and it's not this one thing where i do think a lot of people say yeah apple is think different and everybody knows that but that's definitely not how it works in reality no but there are there are like i said the common threads i mean if you're a celebrity like madonna you're lucky in the sense that you have a very distinctive brand asset that, it, that doesn't change that fast yeah. over time you know? <laughs> And you can yes, you can you can work on it if you want. You can yeah. pay money people to to stay the same. <laughs> and the name, you know, I mean, I, I think about Prince now. Um, you know, Prince. It's funny. Prince became Prince, and then he 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 stopped calling himself Prince. But then people still called him the artist formerly known as Prince because <laughs> you know. Yeah. And and no one calls him the symbol. I just thought was that was piece of genius piece of branding in a way because you know there was no way someone that famous was ever. Uh, people were going to forget what his real name was. I don't know. Just, <laughs> it is interesting. Yeah. But, yeah. 
But of course, I mean, this is Apple we're talking about. This is a brand that's been around for decades. So now maybe we come into the the mm. second question of like, how do we actually build those brands? But maybe we can, can pick up on that mm. later or maybe you can tackle it through the piñata. I don't know. <laughs> maybe I'll quickly, I mean, the, the good side about, I mean, I'm very proud of the piñata particularly because of the acronym works quite well, but but um, uh, it does take a quite a long time to talk through, but I'll just give you a gist of what this is for. You know, The idea is that um, the, the, the clearer a company is about their brand or brand, um, the more they understand what they want it to be, what they don't want it to be, who's it for, what the kind of associations that they want to build around it, the more likely they are to to, to build something compelling and, do, and then have mar um, market activity that's efficient so I, you know, I, I use this as a sort of checklist when I'm talking to brand owners, and 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 sometimes they're really clear about some of the letters of the piñata, but some of their so, so, sometimes they're you know less um, less clear about one or two others. And mm -hmm. interestingly, a lot of brands still don't clearly think about their assets. You know, they don't actually take brand assets as seriously as I I think, and a lot of people think marketers should do. You know, you have to be very clear what you want your assets to be, make sure they're distinctive and ownable enough, and then make sure you use them consistently. Um, and in the in the middle term, and the longer term, those brand assets are gonna be very valuable to you, more, more than you can pro than the lot of marketers probably, probably realize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And and I mean, there's one word on here that's mm. been uh, discussed and disgusting and anything in between, uh, and it's the, the, the P word, the purpose, purpose word. Right? Like, I but but I, I I just already I feel like your your purpose interpretation is really more of like what I would consider a, an essence or something, and I think that's where a lot of the issues come from. But do walk us yeah, through I, your your thoughts on it. About, yeah, exactly. I always, I, in fact, on some versions, I, I whenever I use the word purpose, I then caveat my definition. <laughs> but I, I use purpose to literally mean what's in the dictionary, just like what the thing is for. Yeah, and actually, it's kind of what what you exist. for. For doing not a higher order societal purpose or, or, or it necess doesn't necessarily have to be worthy in any way at, at all but you have to be clear what it is and well, that sounds obvious but what is the purpose of the thing or thing if it's a, pro a one product or a range that, what, what is the purpose of those things yeah what's interesting there is like i think i made that mistake as well like at a certain point we started talking about the the why and the purpose in a way that it almost felt like we needed to make it more and we even like i've even said like what is your purpose beyond making money? That's always like the 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 follow up sentence because you want it to be this do good for the world thing, yeah. and that's where I think it, I things got a little bit cliche. I, <laughs> I don't think that way. I actually think is what is the purpose that your products do that help you make money? And I know that makes me sound like I don't care about you know the, the responsibilities that companies have, big companies have. I do, obviously, I absolutely do. But I don't see that necessarily has to be embedded in every every brand uh, within your range. Now that's something mm -hmm. your company should do. But I think it's perfectly legitimate to have a brand like Snickers that's purpose is to fill you up when you're hungry. There is nothing wrong. I, I can't say any wrong. If you do that well and you produce uh, you produce things in an ethical way, that is the that is a moral um, uh, obligation. But it's not necessarily about Snickers. Yes, it doesn't have to be. Um, it can be uh, that, that it can be part of it as well. That's fine, but it doesn't have to be, in my opinion. Anyway, love that. No, but I mean, I, this piñata is is a very interesting way of looking at it. And you you've put um, customers at like the heart of it for the yeah. people that are listening. There, it's like a star piñata, and there's a yellow center, which is the customers. Like one thing I struggle with is is this interesting idea of. Um, like audience definition versus the idea of targeting everyone, basically Sharp's concept yeah. of, of reaching all category buyers. Like how do you deal with that friction in there? Yeah, I, I, I think um, it's always hard to say this because I'm a, such a big advocate of Byron Sharp and how brands grow. But I think that the idea that brands, all, all brands should target and aim to build uh, their, their franchise across all customers is, isn't correct. And, that, mm -hmm. uh, and I've had a lot of conversations with Joel Rubinson um, in the States who has been working on the concept called the movable middle uh, and validating that concept in packaged goods uh, uh, yeah, categories. And I'm increasingly seeing more evidence that um, 
<laughs> yes, it is an echo chamber. It does back up everything I've learned over 30 years. But no, there are there are certain consumers types for any given category who are going to be more responsive to what you your brand is and does. Mm -hmm. um, and more responsive, therefore, to the, your advertising. And therefore, as a business, you will get a better ROI if you make some conscious decisions about targeting a specific sub-segment of all category users. And I'm absolutely certain of that because all marketers have a finite amount of money. And most marketers not, are operating in a category that's already established, or at least if you are operating in a, a category that's already well established, the idea that, if, especially if you're a new brand, that you're be you're best off targeting all all category users is absolutely crazy. Yeah. Abs if you don't have something that's a little bit different, or you're better in some regard, then you will not. The chances of success are, are, are tiny, unless you have a crazy budget. But that's no, that's never going to happen. So I think that's wrong. And I think also from a media point of view. These days, uh, increasingly, you have addressable audiences where you can you can identify a group, subgroup of people who are more responsive, because mm -hmm. markets people do have differences in what they prefer, and you know a category. I mean, how do you look at, at its worst case? You think about the car category, right? Yeah. If you're selling a Range Rover, you are going to be wasting a lot of money if you go for all car buyers. Now, I know, okay, well, that's not the category. Well, yeah, then you can go for luxury car buyers. But then you're already, you're already showing that, you know, it depends how you define your category. You could say luxury car buyers who like German things. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah. then you're basically just doing segmentation, which is, yes. which is interesting. Like, where does it stop being, like, the category and being a segment? And, and I think, matter. I guess... It doesn't matter. The point is there will be a group of people that you can find them in a certain way who are going to be more receptive to, to what it is that you offer. And if you, you can either call it a big category and, and call the other thing segments, or you can say, well, that's not my category and I'm going to go for this bit. Doesn't make any difference. No, it's it's it's, it's yeah. a very in interesting point, and, and and I've been thinking about it a lot lately. Like as you said, it's it's sometimes we use different words for different things, but these come from practical experience. And I guess this thing like yeah. segmentation is just something marketers in the real world have to do because of resources and because of as you said, like there's some things happening in the market, and and the big data in Sharp's work is really like in aggregate, these things might show yeah. up in that way, but it doesn't really help us in, in a way we want to build brands, right? Yes, exactly. That Joel Rubinson is much cleverer than me. He puts, he puts it in a good way. He's saying that Baron Sharp is talking, it's a descriptive model, mm -hmm. but it's being extrapolated into a predictive model. Yep. You see what I mean? It's like, no, yeah, is, is it exactly. how, how, how your brand could grow? It's not. It's no. how, how the, the profile of, of big brands. It's not how the did they thing. grow? <laughs> yeah, what's the story behind their growth? And it's, you know, I mean, think, I mean, think about go back. I mean, you think about Dove. It's one of the biggest brands in the world, right? Now, today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it didn't start like that. You know, it started. It, it started by um, having a bit of a niche. It was a medical brand. Yeah, so, yes, it was used in the in the war, wasn't it? To, to bandage people. Um, I can't. I'm sorry. I, I, I'll need to look at my details a bit better than this. But the point is, for a long time, it was it was niche, and then it slowly grew. But it couldn't have come in and said, "Right, we're a mainstream soap brand." No, for sure. And and it reminds me of yeah, it reminds me of like Brew Dog, which is a really interesting brand in the sense that they they came from this really like tribal kind of very differentiated but now you see them like putting up big venues in vegas and they're going into spirits and they have all these like and you you can see they're becoming bigger and probably starting to target like almost everyone and it is it is they're they're growing out of their their but they had to start that way otherwise it wouldn't be interesting exactly otherwise they wouldn't have got to that point where they could do it so it's, it's kind of true that if you want to be huge you will have to at some point won't you you will have to attract more um bigger audiences no question yeah yeah exactly um, so but that's fine and there's not and therefore penetration is the ultimate route to growth but at any one point in time the right strategy given your money and is, is to like you say grow from your core because that becomes feasible. Also, you have um, people in the trade who will accept or not accept um, things as well. So there are lots of practical reasons, not yeah. theoretical, why you cannot do it realistically, come in and, and try and target everyone. So yeah, so it's more the, pra it's more the pragmatic things rather exactly. than the stuff. Yeah. yeah. Love that. Smart marketing, basically. So once we know how our brand, like what we what we stand for, what we want to do, how we want to change the world, we have the insights. What's the next step? Well, of course, 
media. Well, there's two next steps. There's innovation and then there's media, obviously. Yeah. Those are the big by brand building um, channels, aren't they? Things you can invest in and need to invest in to, to grow. But focusing on the media side of things, um, yeah, I mean, I've got a f- I've got quite a few frameworks in the book um, to help you think through media selection and media deployment. And actually, that's the area that I've had a lot of traction in the uh, in the sort of uh, LinkedIn world since I looked at the book. Um, but I quite like this this one because it's like quite simple and it makes you think fundamentally. How, how do I know which channels to use? You know, should I be using? I mean, but in its broad sense, you know, should I be using a, a outdoor? Should I be using a Facebook in feed? Um, should I be using TV advertising even, or that's extremely out of fashion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, what what kind of things? And, and within those big broad channels, broadly, what what kind of formats and cha- um, and, and programming and etc. So I think that one thing is right for the brand. In other words, does it fit what what you're trying to do with your brand? So that comes from the brand pinata. You know, what mm-hmm. association? particularly trying to build, obviously, um, uh, who, you, who, who your target audience is. Um, and, 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 and essentially, the most important thing is you've got to do that cost effectively. Yeah. So it's just finding the cheap, cheapest, the best value way of reaching however you've defined as your target audience yeah, in the most cost effective way is obviously what media media planning is all about, but also with a mind to what the association you're trying to build for your brand. And you know, the classic example, it's obvious, but it's just worth just restating is if you're a premium brand, you don't want to be um, in, in outdoor locations that are in the really scruffy part of town, you know, behind the railway station. You know, where all the teenagers hang out or whatever. So that sounds like I'm against teenagers. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I, I just, I'm conscious by us straight out there, clearly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, so you know, it's going to be right for the brand. And also fits the creative idea. And um, I think people often miss this. I mean, some of the most creative advertising, again, think about outdoor again. Actually, the, the counter example is some very clever advertising using, um, using the physical environment that's right for yeah. the brand. I, I love I, it's an, uh, a great example from Japan is um, Bic. Um, Bic talking about uh, obviously the, their message at the time was the, the close the closest shave. You know they were they were brand leaders, so it's legit to to think of such a broad thing. And they have these huge razors, right, uh, are, are, um, in fields. So they'd obviously talk to some farmers, say, "Can we use your field?" Like like often see for outdoor. And they'd mowed a, a, a strip, so you had a lot of grass. A really short graph, and then the huge bic propped up against a, a sort of screen at the end. That's so yeah. cool. It's just so cool, and it's just fun, and it, and it, you know, it implicitly, it's just right. For the creative idea was perfect um, for for the, the message and the brand. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Love that. Like, what's interesting to me here is it's it's Sorry. a more no no don't worry it's a more agnostic approach to picking the media while what we hear today very often is just go for social organic media because that's the cheapest or the the free version which is of course not really the case but th- this is really like trying to look at it from a different way but still probably like if you would look at it from a, a perspective of your you being a small business and the most cost effective is probably the one that has the heavy like yeah i mean in terms of decision making people cho- choose that above all i guess which is i yeah, think maybe it, a little bit yeah. of a frustration it's become the it's become the default you know it's become the, the one that you the, the one that you buy and then you decide whether or not you need to buy any other media but i think yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of there are lots of good reasons for thinking beyond that i mean there, um, i mean one i think one important thought is you've got to think about what you're buying now, um, depending on when this you know, podcast comes out, um, you, you probably by then you'll have seen, hopefully, some research by Ubiquity, Lumen, and T Vision. I've done all the visuals for the, for the booklet um, and got okay. quite involved uh, in, the, in the actual thinking as well because of my, you know, because I'm illustrators and marketers, I think. Um, but um, that talks so much about the value of attention, particularly just the, the value of the amount of time people spend. With, with with the advertising. Yeah. And we know that for in-stream social media advertising, it's on average like a, a second and a half, uh, uh, roughly, that you get. Because people basically mostly scroll quickly past you. We know that, we'll mm. do it. So you're, get, you're getting a, a you know, second and a half. Um, whereas a YouTube pre-roll, oh, I'm gonna get my figures right. A 15 second YouTube pre-roll, you're yeah. getting something like nine seconds of uh, on average. So you're mm. getting like, 
it's six times more seconds. And, and Lumen have done some good research. Lumen do um, eye tracking. Yeah, yeah, um, I know them from some some other researches on TV and, and yeah. And yeah, so they do uh, the digital um, uh, eye tracking as well. And it's, um, you know, they've got some very strong evidence that essentially the number of, uh, the proportion of people and the, the number of seconds they spend on average directly relates to, to, uh, to important things like sales, um, acquisition of, of clients, um, branding effects, et cetera. So you, you do kind of get what you pay for. It may be six, but sometimes it might be four times more expensive, yeah, but six times more effective. Exactly. So you've got to think, you know, it's not necessarily always the best way to go. It might be. Um, and this, I think, probably takes us on. Have you doing a nice segue to, to the next diagram? I think you are. Is the next one the football analogy, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But so the other big argument is actually using a combination of media is often more powerful not, mm -hmm. and gives you a better ROI if you use a particular combination. And Les, uh, Les Binnett and Peter Field have done a lot of work on this, um, showing that a combination of what they called brand, no, do they call it brand development or brand building? Anyway, it's the same concept. Advertising. I think brand building, yeah. We use the friend that brand building, yeah. People use them synonymously, really. Yeah. Brand, or brand building advertising in conjunction with what they call brand act, uh, activation or sales activation, or brand mm -hmm. activation, you also use synonymously. Um, advertising is highly effective and th their average ratio, the, the most effective ratio, they talk about 60, 40, 60 to brand building. Uh, um, it is only an average, but it just shows you, you need a, you know, a whole lot of both and that can be highly effective because brand development is more about, more, more, more where you can tell a story, where you've got nine seconds or even like 14 seconds, if, if you're in the case of a 30 second TV ad, to develop strong, long lasting, powerful memories, positive memories that can last for years actually. Mm -hmm. um, and don't have to be close to the moment when you make a decision. They can be months or years before, if it's powerful enough, combined with some, some maybe cheaper per view sometimes, although not always, with, the price of digital these days, but, um, but, but the, the ones that you can serve are more addressably and closer to the moment or the place of purchase. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And, and <laughs> what's interesting about that, like I see it for a lot of smaller brands, they have a, like, they put all their money on, on the, the attackers that are close to the goal, trying to yeah. like keep like score, but they're, they're not focusing on like getting the ball towards the end yeah. zone, which is, I think a, a big problem. But of course, as you said, like, it's also a budget thing, but the, the fact that you said like, even investing in those more awareness phases can actually be more cost effective than just standing there and hoping the ball will, will come closer. Exactly, exactly. Um, precisely the analogy. You know, if you have, um, I'm so old. If you have Michael Owen standing near the net, <laughs> if, if, you could, if you could update this, the analogy for me, I would really appreciate it. Give me some names of some, you know, anyway, right by the net. If you haven't got your David Beckham in the midfield to, to serve you the Bulls or, your, or Stephen Gerrard, you, you're not going to do very well. Exactly. You need Romelu Lukaku, which is like the Belgium. Uh, and then you need Eden Hazard somewhere in the middle, brand building. <laughs> well, I will use those names in future. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Belgium soccer players are always the best to use, right? Okay, no. Fine. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, this is a very important uh, dynamic. And I, I think like what most people in branding see as like ugly marketing or sales is very often that that last part like what we call activation which i i don't like i like the fact that it's in tandem it's not that you can just say well we don't need to do activation we can just do build emotional branding it's not like that both elements are very important yeah exactly it's it's not what it's it's not one or the other De definitely not it's always both yeah, and, and I, what I think also very is interesting, I, I mean, powerful in this metaphor is that the, the activation part is close, like closer to the goal. Like really when a buyer is in the vicinity of buying, then you need to activate him. But when he's yeah. further away, when he's not even thinking about buying, which means he's not in the market yet for your product, then you should be brand building. And I think that's like a very good way of thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the the, the intent. Um, yeah, cool. Love that. Okay, um, but how do we come up with with good ideas? 
ideas. Okay, so this is more about the ideas that then would manifest themselves in in channels. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like this one because I think um, this is to address the, that sometimes marketing people can can think that the, their brand world is the world. You know, yeah. I mean, it's so <laughs> you can see it, it's it's inevitable. You're close to it. You, you work on it every day. Um, and sometimes you kind of think, well, okay, well, this is our brand. C what can we do that, that excites us about the brand? Or is all about, purely about the brand. Um, Whereas I think the magic, and I, I genuinely would think this is worth every bit of brainstorming uh, you could do um, with the right set of people to come up with, and, and the right set of people may well include um, end customers as part of the uh, research or the, of how you do the mm -hmm. brainstorming or at least feed directly into it because what you're really trying to do is understand um the consumer's concerns around the category you know yeah. you know the the the, the context in, in which their of their life in which they use the brand the more you know about that context and about their concerns and their habits and their lives and their, their concerns and their how it impinges on them the more you understand that then you as a brand team you know your brand's purpose <laughs> As we define it, and the, the pinata essentially, not just the, the, the rest of the pinata, mm -hmm. um, then it's some someone somewhere um, needs to come up with a genius way uh, finding something that is in the intersection of the two. You know, for example, the, the, the Snickers example is someone came up with the, this concept of, you know, people um, people get hungry, yeah, um, they they need food, they 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 they, they get hungry between meals. Sometimes it's a, it's a convenience thing, and it stops them. Um, getting tired or whatever, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then the brand, um, the Snickers brand, is a high energy impact. It's got the chocolate. It's even got peanuts, very nutritious, yeah. and it's all about in the and people already associate with being filling because of that and the historic uh, advertising associations. So someone somewhere, and, and then someone maybe. I, 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 by the way, I do not know the origin of this, but I, but imagine in a in a, a group talking to consumers that someone talked about. Oh, I hate it when my daughter uh, gets hungry because she just is, gets in such a mood. Uh, she acts, you know, she gets, she's not herself. Bang, someone somewhere will have picked up I don't know, and go, ah, oh, you're not yourself, are you, when you're hungry? And then that, everything flowed from that. And then, then, then actually, when you actually think of a specific idea to bring that idea to life, someone says, yeah, people might act like a diva, a real diva. That might be the kind of language that's used. I don't know. That I think is it, and, and it and it can take a while. And some some brands chance upon this, uh, you know, and and they create an ad. And for some reason, this ad, this one ad, maybe it, it works much better than, than previous ads. And then mm -hmm. they 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 kind of reverse engineer and they they do research about the ad and are, and say, well, why do you like this so much? And find out why. And then they can then replicate that success by creating a campaign. I found that a lot of, camp over my, I did a lot of advertising research, I mean, a lot over the years, and, and quite often campaign advice either came out because of a genius idea that a creative had, mm -hmm. ideally one who really understood consumers like this diagram, or they found it by chance when someone happened to, an ad that then reverse engineered what the campaign idea is, and then they did better after that. But so you have to be patient, but uh, I think this is the, the secret. Secret yeah, but I think it's it's interesting that you mentioned that it's not always like the genius rational idea of we found this inside and we're going to put that and it worked. Sometimes it's just like something that happened and it worked and then you reverse engineer and then you start using that as a platform, which I think is is a, is a very smart way way to to look at it and probably even then you still need to keep evolving that platform because it's oh, yes you need to keep it refreshed and uh, modernize it and at some point it might run out of legs um you know probably not as quickly as the ad agency get bored of doing it but <laughs> yeah but it's and, and it's funny like i was uh, looking at car ads the other day and it's like that that's for me it's very funny how that is probably been the same for about i don't know 15 years it's just like nice sexy car driving in the city or somewhere outdoorsy and then yeah. there's this aspirational be who you want to be whatever kind of <laughs> it's like there's that it would be interesting to see somebody innovate but probably it's also because it, it does work and for well, that category but that happens a lot okay sometimes sometimes a category gets stuck in a rut and and those ads do a job of work and they probably give some sort of return on investment but probably not great right that's yeah. probably true I've seen categories where that, and there's a formula, and then people believe that that is the formula, 
and therefore no one has the bravery to break the formula. But in those categories, and I worked on yellow fats, yellow fats, as in butters and margarines, we used to call it yellow fats. Um, very attractive, great market. And it was dull and it had a formula. And back in the 80s, 70s, 80s, it was a family. And, and, and the, at the time it was the mum, actually, not the dad, but it was the mum. And the mum was spreading, spreading it on the, on the thing. And then the child was happy and you're talking about sunflowers. And how, but then it came along, um, what was the first one? I can't believe it's not butter brand. For a start, a brand with a crazy name that yeah. caused a lot of uh, hype and memes. We didn't call them memes back then, but they were effectively memes. But they kind of went around through word of mouth and um, TV news, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Anyway, and they, they, they advertised with these crazy puppets from the Spitting Image satirical um, series that was really big at the time, the same puppets. And it was really kind of, uh, kind of um, confrontational stories, uh, scenarios and funny scenarios. And suddenly, suddenly they, they, they grew this massive market share, you know, within, within months of, of launch uh, and uh, broke the impact norms to smithereens. So there's no such thing as a category norm. I don't believe yeah. that. They just, they just happen to be what current advertisers happen to be doing most of, not what is possible. And actually great advertising smashes that. Yeah, and I mean, that's something because we can get lost in like, for example, the, the whole Ehrenberg Bus Institute data where it's just like, yeah, you have this amount of uh, noise you can make. If you can punch above that, you're going to get more market share. And it all sounds like it's just mathematical. It's like science, it's chemistry. Yeah. You just add a little bit of droplets of advertising and some physical availability and there you go. But you can break out of like these patterns and you can make more noise by having really creative ideas and, and executions exactly not just a bit more but much more it is stand out it's an incredible variable um what was it called there's a paper called i think it's called advertising's top 10 mm -hmm. it was written by paul dyson who was at d2d &D, which was a modeling company at the time and he showed that obviously the biggest variable in terms of roi from advertising is actually how big you are yeah fine Yeah. Bigger brands um, get lots of advantages. They've already got the digital physical availability. So, you know, but, but number two was the creativity, the variable of how creative the advertising was. That yeah. was the, the, the second biggest variable, uh, well ahead, actually, of things like the media spend even, you know, and, and the, 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 the way you target it, et cetera. Very, it's, it's still true. You know, it's a very powerful uh, concept. And, and we know when I worked at Canton Mill, at Millwood Brown, Canton Millwood Brown, Mm -hmm. We had this thing called the awareness index, which was a kind of a measure of the impact per, per pound spent, effectively. You know, yeah. but the variability went there. Were, um, the scale, the highest um, score that I remember was in the 20s, yeah, and the lowest mm -hmm. score was zero. I, I did measure some advertising that had zero impact. There was literally no response <laughs> on any of the advertising response measures or brand measure or anything, zero, nothing, despite half a million pounds. Most go in the range of a, a score of like two, three, or four. Two, three, or four. So you can see the variability. It's at least a, ver a, a multiplier of at least five, so, you know, from creativity. Quite, quite often, at least that. Yeah, and I mean that's a very powerful argument for for really investing in in the craft of creativity, and and it's the same I think with with branding, where it's like, of course, you know, you need distinctive assets, and it needs to work along like category cues and stuff, but there's still this huge leap which determines a lot of the outcome, and I and I like that because I often get stuck in this science as well, and and I'm happy that like we can get brought back to this sometimes. Cool. Um, Another visual, ensuring a clear role for the brand. Yeah, the, the, the reason for picking this one out is because, again, following on from the idea of creative effectiveness, um, it, it's pretty clear that, you know, that big variability we talked about, well, obviously part of it is how engaging mm -hmm. uh, the whole idea is. And we talked about how to come up with an engagement idea. But and if, probably the biggest variable of all is whether or not um, people register what brand it was for so that so that those ad memories that we talked about with apple at the beginning whether they have any chance at all to, to form those links yeah because if people if the brand isn't um present in mind brought to mind um and involved in the rest of the ad if you mean which are usually the more quite often can be the more interesting you know parts more engaging parts then the roi is going to be very very weak so here's just a it, it was some illustration of four 
ways in which you might be able to make sure your brand is is prominent you know in in your in your creative itself and i mean one is a, a sort of a classic you know you actually you often personify you, you create a personification of the brand you know your mm -hmm. brand comes to life or a character becomes effectively becomes your brand like what's his name the guy off um the um slip bang efforts Do you <laughs> yeah yeah those? i can oh, see yeah it? But it doesn't matter. I've still got a strong image of that character, and he, he yeah. personifies the brand. He represents. It's like the brand. A Mr. Mr. Proper as well, like the the bald ah. guy that's always cleaning. Is that? Yeah, is it? yeah, exactly. Mr. Proper. Yeah. He's called Mr. Yeah, he's been called Mr. Mr. Clean. In fact, he was yeah. called that. Yeah. Well, and there was also Mr. Sheen back in the day, which <laughs> was a, a, a little uh, character who flew around in a biplane. I mean, it's a very old-fashioned way. I mean, um, the toilet yeah, duck. Yeah, mascots. Uh, Mascots, they're pretty old fashioned. Um, that represent about oh the jolly green giant is another one. <laughs> of course, these are all these are all branding, um, branding um, distinctive brand assets, but they're they're more than that. They're actually kind of personifying the brand and itself. Yeah. Which is even more, I mean, makes them very, very strong assets. Yeah, they're MMs, rare. for example, is also very good at it, I think. I mean, their products are actually their their characters and playing out the yeah. story, which I think is very smart because they I mean they're there. They don't have to say anymore. It's M and M's. No, it, it guarantees good branding. If you know, if you call yourself Mister Something, or it, uh, it's I haven't, you know, I haven't seen a, that style used for a long time now. I mean, maybe there. Are, I'd love some modern examples to see if anyone is still doing that or something similar to that. Maybe a clever modern take. That would be fascinating if any of your yeah. listeners um, and viewers can can let me know. But but it's it's out of fashion. But it would it would work if if it were done again. No question. If back. I, I tried to, I'm trying to bring back the, yeah. the mascots like <laughs> each branding yeah, no, project I'm, I'm like it. could we could we have a mascot <laughs> yeah the mascots are great I mean, yeah. they're, um, well they're effective I mean it's not just nostalgia it's because they worked and actually you know the evidence is that brands with those tend to have much more branded impact much much more Anyway, um, the second one is agent of change. This is a classic um, device, is it? It's mm -hmm. it's often sometimes it's problem solution. You know, there's a there's a scenario or a difficulty or a, a problem or a or a lack of in, certainly a lack of something. Yeah. And then in comes the brand, and the brand is the thing that makes things better or solves the problem. And really, with those, a lot of it is structurally how you make sure that the brand it's clear and obvious that the brand has made the the transition and therefore yeah. creatively, you need to make sure that that bit is that's the most crucial moment in the ad to ensure that the brand is linked um, yeah, so yeah there's a lot of like examples here of brands that went wrong with it like the the mm. i can imagine the 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 pepsi ad during the the black lives matters protests where they had like the similar thing i think with, with the famous actress putting oh, like, right. the, the rose in the bottle and like it was very like it, they went too far on like because they're still just a soft drink and and i think that's what, yeah, what yeah. to to your previous visual about consumers concerns yes but in the context of the category well, or at yeah, least if you can do more brand. that's better but yeah still that's relevant yes but i think what we are talking about is that, that that brand was trying to do a benefactor ad uh, yeah. like a it, which is which is harder to pull off uh, and and okay you like you said, it's got to have credibility and relevance and you can't just do it overnight. So the next one, the benefactor is effectively saying to the consumer, we're going to show you something that's important and that you care about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we as a brand are are with you. This is where actually we are talking about purposeful brand, the higher yeah. high level purposeful brands. And and that but you have to that well for a start, it, it's not always easy to make sure that the brand is registered. And also it has to be an absolutely genuine and huge endeavor and you need to explain why you have the right to say that and, and uh, make that claim and you have to back it up mm -hmm. uh, and probably you need to have talked about those things before you know the fact that your yeah. company is investing in this and this and this and having a relevance to the category really really helps like i mean again dove another example of the reason it's used again and again because it helps people understand how to make this kind of thing work dove were are a, a cosmetic brand you know beauty brand uh, yeah. They make things to make you to make you look good uh, and feel good, and therefore it, they had a, almost a responsibility and a relevance to making sure that they didn't make people feel bad about how they looked, and that mm -hmm. actually is more important. And they did it with, like you say, they did it with the right balance. 
but it was relevant to, the, to them in the category and they backed it yeah. up with some genuine, um, genuine uh, investment in, in that in, um, in, in awareness of that area etc so yeah and i would say that is better done when it's part of a, obviously it, it's probably better actually if you're a well-regarded brand already as well. yeah and like you said relevant to the category or the brand in some way or intrinsically yeah sure yeah, cool. cool there's one more <laughs> Well, that's kind of just need to brand assets. If I can plug that in, in, in any opportunity I do. And it, it's a hard one to pull up. This is a bit like, you know, um, you, do you get, this is a UK example, but M&S, Marks and Spencer's Food, yeah. Yeah. are famous in the UK anyway for their, have been for their, their food shots. That the way, the, no, the way they film some of their food shots, they literally make you drool because they're so <laughs> nice in, in, in a good way. Um, and they have a sort of a, a very distinctive style and a very distinctive music that goes with it. Okay. Yeah. That is a style. And, and as soon as those ads came on, people go, that's m &S. Yeah. It wouldn't take really long for that style to be associated. But it only worked because it was very different. It was utterly consistent between executions and it built. Um, for sure. And Apple, again, is yeah. used as an example because they have a certain vibe, a look, a feel uh, that is so clear, cleverly can make you know, brought to life, uh, and their packaging is part of that, but also, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really, yeah, I love Apple as an example of like how they show their products in like, it's always very cleanly 3D rendered style, but it's like they then put it in creative compositions and they do fun stuff with it. But it, yeah, there, there's something about it that makes it just so, so attractive. But the, you have to do two things. It has to be distinctive, obviously, yeah. From everything else, really. Ideally, it just doesn't look or feel like. So it's going to be original in that, creatively original, definitely. Mm -hmm. And you have to have that have that consistency over time, so that it becomes that you become the owner of that style. It won't work in the first ad necessarily because it's For just sure. an ad. You no, know, people might like the ad hopefully because it's distinctive and original, and the style is new and fresh. But it won't be owned by the brand until you've used it again and again. Interesting. I think that was actually our our last. Um visual here uh yeah unless yeah, you cool. want to want to grab another one no i think i think we're good on on the visuals very interesting uh stuff for sure um then anything else you want to mention uh maybe just like a general some some ids for let's say people that, that want to build brands maybe some some advice where to go to where to look what what they oh, should, should yeah. learn more about that's the obvious plug. I'm going to talk about my book, aren't I? You need to buy my sure. book. Sure. Here we go. Throw it so, in there. Here we go. Here's my, here's my book, the Smart Marketing Book. Um, please, please buy it. It's, it's, uh, it's short. It's very visual. I think it's got almost all of yeah, It's got all of those visuals in what, or a version of those visuals. Um, but obviously, it's got the narrative that explains the, the thinking around all of them. And it's got um, 75 of those in all. Uh, also, visit my website, which has a lot of the visuals and a lot of other topics. Um, for example, I mean, I could, if you go to smartmarketing.me, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, one of the tabs is called illustration, and oh yeah, you can do it. You can do it live, can you? Um, why not? Yeah, see that tab at the top called illustration. Yeah. There, here we go. But we've got a whole selection of yeah. some <laughs> interesting and useful things. My, the newest one is the one that says mental processes near the bottom, um, and there'll be many more of those coming out once the uh, the ubiquity. And Lumen. In fact, one of them's already out. The first one. If you click on the first one, which should been large. Yeah, click on it again. Here you go. So, for example, this is this is going to be appearing in that booklet I mentioned. Just just a few. It's more of a cartoon than a than a framework, obviously. But just the idea that you know the brand, the, the brain is always scanning around the whole world, looking for, look you look at all the data that's coming into its eyes and its ears until it finds something that might be important, or scary, <laughs> or relevant, or an opportunity. And it's only those ones that even have a chance of uh, coming to, to, to memory. And that's why advertising is so uh, such a challenge to actually get people to notice, but also why if you get it right, you can have uh, an ROI that's five or 10 times bigger than you would have got because you've managed to, to grab that attention. Whereas most of the thing and most of the ads um, that we come across, like the vast majority, um, we, we skip through and hardly notice, but some, if they're original and interesting, et cetera, and grab us, are, are incredible. And that's why variability of creativity is so important. And not yeah. just a, not just A-B testing, things that are pretty similar to each other anyway. Okay, well, you'll find the best of the bad bunch, but 
that's not going to give you a great ROI. Um, if, yeah, it's like testing ROI. between light gray and, and light beige and, and seeing if that's like a different ROI, but it's probably not going to make the difference, right? Yeah, whereas you might have wanted a, a neon blue or something, you know? Yeah. <laughs> No, but it, that's really like, and, and it, it begs the question, of course, like, but how do we grab attention? And I guess the answer is very hard because like the way our brain works is sometimes it might pick up on something and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, but there are some experts out there who, who, who do know what to do, how to do it. Uh, really, really creative people who, who know about attention. That's kind of why I did the section. Originally, this whole section was called attention. Uh -huh. um, to try and at least highlight some of the some of the things, um, but there are there are there are ways you can do it. Um, it's like I, a big I, red screen alert, alert, alert. Yeah, <laughs> no, well, maybe, maybe, but but also it might be just knowing how to engage, how to how to you know the things that really engage people and draw them in, and you know a storyline, a storyline that's that's connected to um, a person's life they can identify with. Yeah. can be very, very powerful. And there are certain tricks and ways you can make sure that um, ads um, draw people in very quickly at the start, which is increasingly important these days, yeah. you know, the first second or two. Uh, we know the first five seconds is important on YouTube, on certain that. Just there are ways of doing that. And music is an incredibly powerful way of doing it. Yeah. You know, um, colors and contrast, people's faces. I mean, it's, there are ways. But ultimately, if you want to hold their attention, then actually something that's immediately relevant to them can keep them for the, for the for full duration and using striking visuals and so etc. I, I work for um, I work closely with the Ameritest, which is a uh, company that focuses on copy testing, on pre-testing, mm -hmm. and they are true experts at helping helping companies do exactly this um, with their with their creative. So yeah, can be I done. That. Yeah, mm -hmm. it reminds me of like I'm I, I love this podcast called True Line uh, from NPR. And it's like their whole way of telling a story is very elaborate and slow and there's like a lot of just silence maybe sometimes it's like 10 seconds of just letting something rest and it it works for me in a way that's like it's so different and that's also interesting like going the opposite direction when you're grabbing attention it doesn't always have to be loud but it's no. just no think about think about um action movies have you ever been to an action movie where it's too much and it is mm -hmm. just explosion after car chase, after explosion, after car chase, after this, after that, and you're jumping off the cliff. All the, and you just, they're not actually great movies because the, yeah. they haven't got that rhythm. They haven't got yeah. a ebb and flow. We used to call it like a, you want, pacing is really important. Even just a 30 second video ad, pacing. So you sort of, change of pace is one I, yeah. I remember from the learnings that we did. You know, use of music with that, ups and downs, highs and lows. Are, are important. Like at Ameritest, there's, uh, we use something called the flow of attention. And the very best ads aren't the ones that are just you know, are flat, even if it's reasonably attentive, attention mm -hmm. graphics. The best ones are like you just go like that, up a peak, and then there's sort of a bit of a downtime. And those peaks are quite useful because they make it easy for the, 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 the whole ad to go to memory. They're like yeah. little markers, markers that are particularly memorable. But you need to, the, 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 the brain needs a few seconds after these things you know, to take them in and, and a little downtime and up and down. It's a fascinating subject. This. I love this. I, this is, yeah, uh, I'm, that's... I'm, learning, I'm still learning a lot about this, this area. Yeah, looking forward to those uh, reports. And, and I, I guess this will be out in, in a few weeks. So maybe we can share the, the report in the show notes. Okay. Uh, yeah, it'll be out in early June and it's called the, the Cost of Attention is the report. Um, uh, yeah, I've put a lot of uh, effort into the visuals for this one. Love that. Well, uh, Dan, this was this was really great. So, so thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Bye bye.